Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Strategies to Engage Struggling Readers with Learning Differences. My name is Vanessa Lombardo, and I'm an outreach coordinator for Bookshare, and I will be moderating our event today. We are excited to have each of you here, and thank you for taking the time to join us. Our goal today is to explain what Bookshare is and which students qualify for Bookshare membership. We are also going to hear from Kaylee, Ella, and their parents about the strategies they use to support their learning differences and how they use Bookshare as one tool in their toolkit. And finally, we will hear and learn from Dr. Andy Kahn from understood.org. We wanted to show a short one minute video to briefly explain Bookshare. Let's take a listen. Inside every book is a new world and nothing should keep you from exploring. Whether you're learning to read, studying for an exam, or just having fun, Bookshare helps you read in ways that work for you. Choose your favorite high quality voice and listen to your books. Stay focused with karaoke style text highlights. Adjust text to your perfect size, speed, color, and contrast. Choose from over a million titles, ready to read on nearly any device. And the best part? It's free for U.S. students who qualify, and less than a dollar a week for qualified adults. So start reading in ways that work for you, and explore new worlds with Bookshare. So let's delve a little bit deeper. So what is Bookshare? It is a free ebook library funded by the Office of Special Education Programs. And as the video described, it lets students read in ways that work for them on any device they already have, such as a smartphone, a Chromebook, or a laptop. There are currently over 1 million titles in the collection, including textbooks and books for pleasure reading in a variety of formats, such as audio, large print, and braille. To be clear, students have to qualify to use Bookshare, and they are in one of three categories someone who has a learning disability, a person who is blind or has a visual impairment, or a physical disability that impacts the way they interact with traditional print. So a student has to qualify in one of these three categories in order to use Bookshare. Bookshare operates under the US copyright law and a professional who's working with the student needs to verify that they do have a disability in one of these categories. This professional can be a tutor, a vocational rehab counselor, a social worker, a classroom teacher, an OT, a PT, or other professional. It doesn't have to be a medical doctor, but it can be. Once the student qualifies and registers for Bookshare, they have access to our full collection of over 1 million titles of accessible books. I would like to now introduce our guest students, Kaylee Watson, a high school senior from California and her mom, Alana, and Ella Johnson, a high school junior from Minnesota and her mom, Beth. Thank you all so much for joining us. First, let's do introductions. Kaylee and Alana, would you start and please tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Kaylee. Um, I am a high school senior and uh, I'm from Northern California. Um, I'm dyslexic and I started using Bookshare when I was in third grade. So about age eight, nine. And I'm Alana. I'm her mom. Um, I, uh, before becoming a stay-at-home mom after the second, um, after my second child was born, I was a case manager and dietitian at the local children's hospital. Great, thank you very much. And Ella and Beth, would you please introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Ella and I go to high school and I'm a junior at um, Irondale um, in New Brighton, Minnesota. And I'm dyslexic and dysgraphic and I'm in a, all AP and college courses right now. Um, and I do a lot in the band programs at my school. <laughs> And I'm Beth, her mom, obviously, and um, I'm actually a speech clinician who works in special education in a school district, and I'm an assistive technology augmentative communication consultant, so I actually work with Bookshare at work, too. 
wonderful. Thank you both so much. Okay, so let's start with a question for the parents. So tell us about when you realized that your child was having some difficulty reading. Alana, would you start us off? Oh, sure. Um, I, it was quite a surprise to me. Um, when my daughter entered kindergarten, um, she was in the advanced reading level. And even before, she, before preschool at 24 months, she was incredibly verbal. And I felt that I would not have any problems with her at school. I could just drop her off and it would be a piece of cake. Um, by the time second grade came around, she was in the lowest reading group. I don't think she had made any progress. And my concerns um, I shared with the teachers uh, and who kept uh, reassuring me that she was fine because she was at grade level and a top math student and I didn't need to worry about her. I shared my concerns with our pediatrician who convinced me to do um, a full eval, regardless of where she was uh, at grade level. And I'm so glad I did because I do know that um, being able to catch her, you know, her learning difference earlier definitely helped her not have to get so far behind like others do. And it really opened up a whole new perspective to me about learning differences and learning about all the different ways that you can learn and grow. And I think that was a turning point for me as a, as a person. Absolutely. No, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about Ella and same thing when you realized that she was having some difficulty with reading and in school. Uh, when she was probably in kindergarten, uh, just even learning letters and remembering their sounds was really kind of difficult for her. And then really, it really kind of hit home after first at the end of first grade when at the end of the year, the teacher tells you what you should work on over the summer and her, her suggested we work on those sight words that she had struggled with all year. We set up a whole plan. We're ready to practice all summer. We you know, had a little chart, so we're going to keep track. We gave up after about a week because it was torture for everybody. She just couldn't remember them, even you know the very basic words, and just decided to just read. And um, she was always a really hard worker, and was always um, able to be at grade level. Sounds like a familiar story. So she didn't really struggle a lot at school, but she had to work really hard to be average uh, until. Um, we, I knew working in special education, she'd had supports at elementary school that wouldn't be there when she moved to middle school. So I knew she needed to be tested before she left mid elementary school to at least have a 504 in place or something. So she'd have supports in middle school and lo and behold, she qualified as dyslexic and dysgraphic and had, you know, reading scores that were a lot lower than I had expected based on, you know, knowing Ella. So um, that's kind of when she started with Bookshare and just kind of changed her life. And mm -hmm. yeah, and we were familiar with Bookshare because you know, my son actually has mild cerebral palsy and he was using it too. So, mm -hmm. and after the first testing session, they're like, here, go sign up. Yeah. <laughs> she needs this. Sure. No, absolutely. Right. Getting those accommodations in place. Certainly. No, that's great. Thank you so much. So now the students, so um, maybe Beth, um, I'm sorry, Ella, you could start us off. Tell us when you yourself realized you know, that you were maybe having some, some difficulties in terms of reading and in school, you know, what was the most difficult for you? I didn't really notice myself until later on in elementary school. So probably about third or fourth grade, I'd say. And it was mostly that I was getting pulled out of class to go to other classes that other people weren't and classes where everyone else was working on reading comprehension and they just wanted me to be able to read fast or up my fluency because <laughs> I could remember what I was reading. I just couldn't read it at the pace that they wanted me to. And yeah, and when yeah, other kids started reading chapter books and I was still struggling to read more than like a short paragraph by myself and yeah I think mm -hmm. that was Absolutely. probably the hardest sure sure right seeing all those differences of course as you said as you're moving through the grades absolutely thank you for sharing that 
Um, Kaylee, what about your experience? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm um, very similar um, to what Ella said, kind of like um, second, third grade. Um, I kind of started noticing that I've been having a lot more trouble in school. Like math for me always um, came fairly naturally. Um, and so that was something that I was um, grade level in. And so that didn't really um, set off any alarm bells in my head, but definitely with like reading and um, writing, especially um, just kind of like those more language arts um, type things that those were extremely hard for me. Um, it was hard for me to read chapter books, um, even like Junie B. Jones or kind of like the beginning chapter books, um, whereas all my classmates could kind of easily read them um, in a couple class times. And so I kind of started noticing that it was a lot harder for me um, than some of my classmates, but I didn't really make the connection um, at that age that there was something wrong. It was kind of just like, oh, huh, that's kind of interesting. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Yeah, making those observations, as you said, and obviously as, as Ella said as well. So now let's transition to talking a little bit about some strategies, right? So Kaylee, maybe you could continue, you know, what strategies did you use to support your learning um, as you were going through school, maybe in the beginning and, and certainly anything that you continue to use as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I um, started using Bookshare immediately, kind of trying to get used to ebooks and things like that. Um, and it was completely new to me. So there was a little bit of a learning curve, but something that definitely helped me was kind of like um, trying out a lot of different things and establishing what strategies and tools helped me the best. Um, and so um, I've kind of over the years like perfected how I use my um, Bookshare account. And so like I'll download my books into Voice Dream um, or onto Apple iBooks and then I'll use the speech to text. Um, and I even have specific voices that I usually use. Um, I usually use like the Samantha, I think that's one of the voices available. Um, and so kind of once I had that set up, um, it was a lot easier for me because um, that was a voice that I liked um, and that I could understand really well. Um, and it just kind of helped me um, be able to understand and read at a high level without having to do the actual act of like decoding and visual processing and like tracking with the different lines and things like that. Um, so that's definitely helped me for reading. Um, something else that really helped me um, was just kind of being able to use a computer eventually um, with like typing and um, doing other things. Um, also because when you're on the computer, you can have it read to you. Um, so kind of mainly those things, kind of just like assistive technology to help with a lot of different things. Absolutely. Ella, what about you? What are some strategies that you use to support yourself in terms of learning differences and, and getting everything done for school? Mm -hmm. I, yeah, after fourth grade, I switched to pretty much reading everything on Bookshare or using like a screen reader on like my technology at school and everything. And that was like, a world of difference for me. I was able to read like all the books for like the book challenges we did at school and do all the different like fun things that all my other classmates were doing in terms of reading and like engaging with like different forms of literature. <laughs> and mm -hmm. yeah, it's really helped me even after that, keeping up with all my classes and doing all my work and especially being able to have things read back to me when I type them out or like, um, like dictating it to like my computer and not having to type everything has been really helpful. And yeah. Absolutely. And when you're dictating it, are you typically using the built-in, like let's say on a Chromebook, the Google dictation, or is it a different type of program? What are you using when you're actually dictating your work? I know on my phone, sometimes I'll do schoolwork where I just open up Google Docs and use the built-in speech to text. Mm -hmm. um, and then on like my Chromebook for school, I have um, Read Write Google. Is that what it's called? <laughs> Read and Write for Chrome. Read and Write for Chrome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> great. Yeah. And I use that. So wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right. Great. Um, and so both of you, you know, in terms of, you know, when you first use Bookshare, we talked a little bit about, you know, some of the features that are most beneficial. I also wanted you to talk, and certainly you could expand on that if, if you wanted to, but also how has Bookshare transitioned with you, you know, over time? So Kaylee, you had mentioned that you had started using it, you know, very young, as you had mentioned, second grade, maybe eight years old, um, now certainly being, you know, in, in uh, almost in college. Talk a little bit about that transition over time. Yes, yeah, so there definitely was um, a learning curve. I wasn't really used to reading on the tablet and kind of being different from all my classmates. Um, so it did take me a little while to kind of get used to that. 
Um, mm -hmm. And moving to a different school where um, it was kind of okay for most people to use eBooks um, was very helpful. And so I kind of just refined what I would use it for. Um, something that I really like about eBooks is that um, I can do little annotations and notes, um, which I kind of started doing when I'm doing higher level things like writing essays on books and doing mm -hmm. other sorts of things where I have to upload text and kind of want to take notes on it. Um, it helps in a lot of different ways. Like all my notes will stay organized and I can use color coding. Um, and like write like little notes in the margins of different things kind of like within the virtual um, online system. Um, and then it also is really easy because I can just search for certain words or phrases in the text that I remember. And so if I'm trying to write an essay and I wanna quote something as evidence, I don't have to go searching through like a 300 page book. Um, I kind of have all my notes there. So that's something that I've definitely started doing a lot more often. Um, as I've gotten older, um, as well as just reading a lot more books in general. I feel like I've kind of um, read more books every single year that I've been alive. So, uh, yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. That's a great goal to have. That's great. Wonderful. Um, and Ella, what would you say again? Same thing, any specific book share features, but also, you know, that transition over, over time. Talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. I've definitely transitioned um, from when I first started using book share. It was very basic. I like would only just read the book and not really use most of the features um mm -hmm. but as i've you know gone through middle school and now high school i've definitely used a lot more of like taking notes and like writing down like what i think about in like my classes or my books for my classes and it's mm -hmm. super helpful to yeah, be able to search th for things and yeah i've noticed that it's i i barely even think about it now but all my like friends will be like spending a lot of time looking for something some certain like phrase in a book and I'm just able to look it up right away it just was really helpful but yeah absolutely no that's really great excellent yeah having having some of those features and you said you know just in different situations and and making it you know making them most beneficial to you uh to work work for you that's great um so let's transition back to talking a little bit in terms of parents, you know, uh, Beth and, and Elena, what changes did you see, right? When your children started using Bookshare, other technology, uh, maybe Beth, why don't you start us off? You know, what, what were the changes that you saw in, in your daughter? Uh, I think just in general, the confidence went I mean, kind of through the roof that now, like she said, she could read books just like her friends read. Um, she didn't have to depend on anybody else to read them to her. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's always managed her own bookshare account. So at the very beginning, I was like, you know, just go to the media center and find books you want to read and look them up and download them and read them. And that was kind of how she got started. And, um, and she's never also had, she's never had any kind of special tutoring that a lot of kids who are dyslexic have. Um, she's only really ever used Bookshare and I just, the changes in her uh, reading level have always gone up and up and up. And she's always been one to watch those words go across the screen. And I just, I think it's truly changed the way that she can read silently. Um, she still struggles to read out loud. And like she's described to me at one point, she, you know, she can look at a word and she knows what that word is in her head but she can't read it out loud, but she can read it silently to herself. And I think that's something that Bookshare changed even within her brain and the way that she sees words and knows them. Um, so yeah, it's just a world of difference. I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg. I think those things that have changed in her because of it. I mean, and obviously her schoolwork, she would never be able to be in the classes that she's in if she had to do all that reading in the traditional way. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that she can, and go to an AP class and day one download that book and do all of her reading just like everybody else and faster than everybody else probably <laughs> and that leaves her more time to then you know take that knowledge and apply it so mm -hmm. things that she would have to struggle she would just struggle with if she didn't have it so so much mm -hmm. and it's just a total life-changing experience. I just, I can't even emphasize it enough. How much, <laughs> can you tell? <laughs> no, no, that's that's wonderful. But that access, right? Having that yes. <laughs> to the text is so right critical. You know, the the opportunities that that, um, you know, affords someone. So that's really great, wonderful, yeah. very cool. Um, a lot of what would you say, you know, what changes did you see in Kaylee, you know, over, over this time? Um, so, 
so unlike um, Beth, we actually did a couple of years of remediation with an Orton Gillingham method from third yeah. through fifth grade. And then with some transition from fourth grade to middle school that we started to also add on Bookshare. And it was a slow, slower transition. Um, and we were fine with that because we were, um, we wanted her to be able to utilize books in a variety of way. Now, as the coursework started to go up, um, we felt more and more comfortable with her using the assistive technology at, at the middle school age. And I would say that we never, she always had a positive relationship with books. We always read to her. We never forced her, um, even when she was struggling with reading. Um, and what happened with Bookshare was that it allowed her to continue to enjoy books and at a, an even faster pace. So I would say by sixth grade, I said, here you can, there's the library card, there's Bookshare, she also used Learning Ally and Common Sense Media, and you pick your books, I trust you, because I just could not keep up with everything she wanted to read. Um, mm -hmm. And it's been like that since, and she knows way more about how to use her assistive technologies than I do. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And all that advocacy, because as we've talked about over time, not in this particular webinar, but when we're, you know, talking about Bookshare and we're talking about the student really needs to take that ownership, right? So when they do transition into whatever it is after their K-12 experience, that they have those, those tools, you know, to, to use and that they have the ownership of using them. Yeah. So that's really what there is that, that transition. Yeah. And it's not just for education. I mean, she enjoys reading. It's one of her favorite hobbies. Mm -hmm. she, it provides her with comfort, entertainment. And there are many times she will choose to read in her room than watch TV. Mm -hmm. and I think that's kind of incredible for someone who struggled with reading um, mm -hmm. in kindergarten. Yeah, absolutely. No, that is, that is great, wonderful. Um, so parents, what is your advice, right? For other parents, um, who are trying to support their students. Maybe they're not really sure where to start. Um, maybe a lot, if you could continue, you know, what, what advice would you give to other parents? Um, uh, a few things, thinking back, know you're gonna make mistakes and have compassion for yourself and your child. I made so many mistakes. And so the advice I'm going to give to you, I didn't follow, whole, I've learned the hard way. <laughs> um, the first thing is protect your relationship with your child at all costs. Um, that's the most important thing. Well, perhaps remediation, assistive technology and accommodations, advocacy skills are all important and you figure out to what degree you wish to do. Spend more time though on their strengths because their strengths is what is going to put smiles on their faces, ha have, have meaning in their life. And the books are a tool to helping them support their areas of strengths. Um, so I think my biggest advice is to support your child, protect your relationship with them, support their passion and strengths um, more than all the other, all the remediation. Um, that's good, it's got its place. And in the end, um, know that it's gonna be okay. Wonderful, that's great. Um, Beth, what would you say? Again, advice for parents who are just trying to, uh, you know, maybe starting out and not quite sure, you know, where, where to start. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with uh, the remediation piece. I mean, re remediation is great. I work in special education. You know, that's kind of the, the business of that. Um, so, but not to get so hung up on that, that you don't allow your child to use other tools that are out there. I see a lot of that actually in the schools where parents are, are really hung up on their child has to read in a traditional way. Mm. Well, the, the truth is that takes time if you're struggling. It, you, nobody's saying you can't and you won't learn how to read in a traditional way, but the remediation piece takes time and you don't want to lose that time and deny them access to literature at, that's at their cognitive level that, that, they, that they need to be reading and, and learning from. Um, I think that's the biggest thing like I said, that I see parents do is to wait too long 
to introduce some of these tools to their kids mm -hmm. because I mean, like Ella is going to need this her entire life to some degree or another. Mm -hmm. And the earlier you start, the easier it is to continue to use it. I think it becomes just normal in the way that you do things and you don't feel like you look different than your peers because you know you need it and you know it helps you. Mm -hmm. um, the longer you wait to do that, I think the harder it is a lot of times to get the kids to, to accept it and to use it and to really take these tools like these two girls have and just fly. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So um, that would be the big thing that, like I said, I, I see it all the time in schools and mm -hmm. um, you just, you, you need to have an, a good balance of both. And in the way I, I think the easiest way kind of for us to find that at first was Bookshare was really for her leisure reading. I and mean, she, that's what she did for fun. It was the the entertainment piece of it and where she truly loved, learned to love to read. Mm -hmm. And then it became more academic as she got older, mm -hmm. but it was, but that foundation was there then that she knew how to use it. And then she has a few other tools that she learned to use when she was young too. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. No, that's, that's so important. As you said, that, you know, having, we talk about this a lot too, that Bookshare is one tool, right? One, one tool, one strategy, one, mm -hmm. one way, you know, to, to access this, but certainly we want students to take advantage of as many things, you know, as possible and, and what is really best for them. So that's really a great, a great message. Well, and I also taught her young, I'm like, don't let anybody tell you that using Bookshare isn't reading. You are reading mm -hmm. with your ears, just mm -hmm. not with your eyes and with your eyes too, just not in the way that everybody else is, but you are reading just like everybody else. And, mm -hmm. and she's had teachers kind of imply that it wasn't reading. And you, know, you tell them that you are reading just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that advocacy, self-advocacy piece is huge too. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. No, that is, that is really great and very important for sure. Wonderful. Um, so students, what is your advice, right? For students who are struggling with reading, maybe they would benefit from using tech. Um, Kaylee, you know, what? talk about what your advice might be for your fellow students. Yeah, definitely be open to everything um, and give everything a try, um, no matter how crazy it might seem, because I know that there's always new technology um, and things like that. And also um, kind of what Beth was saying, like don't care about what other people are telling you or there's, if they're saying, oh, well, if you just listen to it, that's not reading or that's not the way that you're supposed to do it because everyone does things their own way. And so um, I feel like that's really important. And then also just kind of experiment with the different um, types of books that you can download for Bookshare. I think file types and things like that to see like what um, reader you like, what voice you like, like what the what font you want uh, or what fonts that you like. Um, and one font that I actually really like is Open Dyslexic. Um, they space the letters out um, and the line spacing out um, so that it's a lot easier for me to track and read. And so I found that that helps me differentiate between letters and not have to put extra effort into that. Um, so that's something that I've found that I really like. Um, so kind of just like experiment with different things, see what you like. Um, I also like using Otter AI. It's um, kind of like a recording, transcription and dictation. Um, software. And so um, I kind of sometimes have that on my computer, or on my phone, and I can use that for lectures or if I'm kind of trying to brainstorm an essay and keep getting stuck with the wording, I would kind of just talk about what I'm thinking of. And then after that, um, edit it and pare it down to what is actually an essay. And that's what I did for my college essays with my counselor. Mm -hmm. So that worked really well. So kind of just see what works best for you, um, trial and error, and then just um, stick with the things that you know work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, that's great. Um, Ella, what would you say to your fellow student? Um, kind of similar, you know, ex experimenting is so important. And I know for me, it was finding out, yeah, what technology works and how I want to use it and where I'm going to use it. And like my mom said, um, I think first reading for like leisure and just, yeah, learning what kind of books that I like would like to read because I know when I started using books here I didn't really know what I wanted to read and mm -hmm. I because I had never really had the opportunity to like figure that out and mm -hmm. it really helps to just kind of read everything and try out everything and figure out yeah what font I want or what highlight like for the words I wanted and like mm -hmm. how to best like tailor that to me <laughs> Mm -hmm. And yeah, 
experimenting with yeah different types of technology I know I have a reader pen that I use especially on tests at school that has really helped me and yeah just try everything <laughs> and see what works <laughs> Sure. No, absolutely. No, that is that is definitely solid advice. Um, I was just looking through the chat. There was a question about, you know, specific tools. I know that we've mentioned a few. So we had mentioned, um, Kaylee, you had mentioned Voice Dream Reader um, as one of the apps that you're reading for Bookshare books. Um, Ella, what is the name of the pen? Again, just if people are, you know, curious, what do you know the, the make, the brand of the pen that you're talking about? It's C pen yeah. is like the title. Yeah, yeah. she has a C pen reader. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and there's two different kinds. There's a white one, which is like for everyday use, any kind. And then there's an orange one, which is specifically designed for testing. And mm -hmm. for that's you can use on like, uh, what is it called? Like standardized it's, tests. Standardized tests. Yeah. Like <laughs> important <Right>. ones. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right, right. And the letter C. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so, so much to our panelists. We really appreciate your um, all the information. Uh, certainly, if there's any additional questions, we'll try to answer them in the chat as well. Um, but again, panelists, thank you so, so much. All right. So now let's move on to speaking with Dr. Andy Kahn from Understood. He is a licensed psychologist specializing in working with individuals who think and learn differently. For nearly 20 years, Dr. Khan worked within the public school system, providing trainings, evaluations, direct consultation, and therapeutic supports to students, their families, and staff. He has worked closely with underserved communities struggling with the impacts of poverty, food insecurity, and limited access to educational support. Additionally, he supported school communities to develop policies on mental health, suicide prevention, and access to learning interventions. At Understood, Dr. Khan focuses on ADHD, autism spectrum disorders, anxiety, general learning and behavioral challenges, and learning and social emotional functioning. Thank you so much for joining us here today as well. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's, it's a tough act to follow when you have those young ladies talking about all the things they've done and all the amazing growth they've made. And I think if there's any great takeaways to have from, from such a message is that be flexible, be kind, be there for your kids and and to giving them the greatest opportunities possible for doing what they are capable of with support. So without much ado here, I want to go into some of my objectives here today and talking about the objectives for you know learning about learning differences. First and foremost, our first objective is to be able to identify what learning differences are and what they are not. Second, to know the emotional impact of learning and thinking differences and what they can have for students. And finally, to be able to name three benefits of inclusive technologies. And the young ladies were referring to this, they might've used the term assistive technologies as well. We use them somewhat interchangeably in helping students with learning and thinking differences. When we use the phrase learning and thinking differences and understood, we're typically talking about things like ADHD and dyslexia, dyscalculia, and things of that nature. Next slide, please. So when we talk about learning and thinking differences, we're talking about a large portion of the population. As many as 70 million Americans have learning and thinking differences. These differences are what we consider variations in how the brain processes information. It affects all aspects of their educational process. It affects how they learn to read, how they learn to do math, focus, follow directions, engage in writing tasks, things of that nature. And we see that it can be fairly significant with so many young people and adults in, are impacted by this. Next slide, please. So what are learning and thinking differences? Well, first and most importantly, they're real things. These are real experiences. This isn't some mythological idea to try to get somebody some sort of support that they don't deserve. This is about brain wiring. The human brain is wired very specifically. And when you think about it, every brain has some differences in how they're put together. So if there's a wiring difference that affects the way that you see words on a page or the way that you hear that someone is expressing their thoughts to you or in how you understand math, that wiring difference is exactly that, it's a difference. So when we think about it, um, those things that are going on sort of below the hood 
um, those aren't terribly obvious differences. You know, looking at um, Kaylee's background, Kaylee's mom talked about, hey, my kid is really smart and she's successful and she's doing all these great things when she's little. Um, and then her mom comes to the realization, wow, this wasn't obvious. There were things going on that we they learned about over time. So when you think about something outside of what a parent would observe, it's also sometimes difficult for teachers to observe. So we have to understand it isn't obvious. Learning and thinking differences are highly variable. They can vary across people. So if I give you a room with three people with dyslexia, they may be very different in how they read and how they understand information. The same would go for people with ADHD. So the variability can also be seen within the individual. So that person might have moments where they're struggling with something in, for one period of time and it's easier at others as they develop. One very important thing about what learning and thinking differences are is that they're an opportunity or a reason to provide information to those individuals in a, varieties of, a variety of ways. We have to think about being flexible. If we have a singular way to teach or we're overly rigid in how we instruct our students and children, we're going to find difficulties when people have different wiring. So it really challenges those of us who are working with students to come up with some creative strategies. Finally, learning and thinking differences are quite common. They occur in a large number of our population and require that flexibility for parents and teachers and sensitivity. Those differences exist whether or not we want them. And sometimes for kids, when we first start talking about that experience, it, they require some reassurance and some support to help them do things that might be harder for them than they'd like them to be. Next slide, please. So what, are, what aren't learning and thinking differences? What are these things not? I know it's an awkward sentence. So um, a learning and thinking difference isn't something that's wrong with you. It's not something that, that needs to be fixed or something that is an excuse to pull you from a classroom. Learning and thinking difference isn't a weakness that just requires you work harder or you provide more effort. It's not a sign of lower intelligence. People with learning and thinking differences are as smart as anyone else and they're no less capable. They may just require different methods to learn and to express themselves. So keeping in mind for us, when we've talked about being kind with our students, this is one of the keys here. These are mythological ideas. And I don't know how many times when I was a, a student with learning and thinking differences when I was young, where I heard over and over again, you just need to, to provide more effort. You gotta do more, you gotta try harder. And it can be such an impact to the emotion of the student. Next slide, please. So when we think about the emotional side, the things that you will see with young people with dyslexia, we see emotional responses. In fact, in all of my years in the classroom, more often than not, I would be brought into a classroom to look at behavior, to see how children and students were acting and interacting within that setting. So oftentimes what I would see is at the start of an activity, like a reading task, kids would go to their book box, they'd grab a book and they would start to agitate. The books actually became a trigger for their emotional responses. And we'd see things like angry acting out. We'd see them misbehave or showing a lot of frustration. And those behaviors were just their own reaction to how they felt about what was challenging for them. The harder things are for a child, the less confidence they're gonna have and the less willing they're gonna to be to engage in the classroom tasks. So even if you're not seeing behavior necessarily in your child, you may see them withdraw, pull away, stop raising their hand or stop talking during those parts of the classroom you know, opportunity. So next slide, please. When we think about the things that you may see and the emotional reactions that may be visible to you, again, negative comparisons are a big factor. If a student is sitting there with a book and they're looking around the room and seeing their peers having more success or moving through the books much more quickly, they're very likely to start comparing and saying, well, what does that mean about me? And why can't I do this? I think I'm smart enough, I think I'm capable. But for those youngsters, it can be extremely challenging. And we start to see them develop some mindsets and thinking about themselves, being critical, refusing tasks, self-distracting and being a window watcher or engaging in things other than what's required of them. And those are forms of self-protection. The idea is about escape and avoidance. These are the things that we see very commonly with anxiety. If something scares you, you wanna get away from it. You want to avoid things that are unpleasant for you. So it's really important to think about that because a lot of what we may see initially is emotion with our young students and helping them learn about different ways to become more successful academically and providing them with supports. Next slide, please. One of the things that we see very commonly in America 
is how often do you see someone say, yeah, I'm bad at math. Um, you know, I, I just, I, I was told to be no math here. I, I'm, I'm not great with numbers. Culturally, it's very common for Americans to say that for whatever reason. I think that we've desensitized ourselves to the idea that somehow math's supposed to be hard and it's okay if we struggle. But I, how often do you hear I'm bad at reading or I, I don't know how to read? It's something that is much more associated with shame. People do not have um, the, the comfort to say that out loud and to, and to engage with that in the day to day. So it's something really to think about in terms of our culture. And when you look at our kids, there's a lot more shame that comes along with being dyslexic or struggling with reading. Next slide, please. One of the great things, and I think both Kaylee and Ella spoke to this, was that because they are different learners and, and they have different needs, um, and they're certainly different thinkers, but both extremely bright kids, what we saw was their ability to engage in content with content that they liked um, had to come through some alternative means. So getting access to tablets and smartphones and computers that allowed them to access and break the association with a physical book um, for many kids can be a really helpful thing and getting access to more and more interest related material. One of the important findings is that, you know, in modern day, kids are doing most of their reading outside of school on technology. They're not picking up papers. They're not picking up books. They're picking up their, their tablet. They're picking up their, their game console and they're reading things within the context of their activities of interest. So we have to understand that the way we provide content and access to content can be a really great stress reliever and it can be something that accelerates and magnifies their interest. Okay, next slide, please. When we think about how we get to where we need to go as students, and you see, you know, Kaylee and Ella, and they're such great examples of youngsters. They're not just, they're not just learning to read and being reasonably successful as students. These kids are thriving. The reason they're thriving is in no small part due to their parents' great support, but also they are, they're sort of the poster children for what we often see in universal design for, for learning. This is a method of instruction that we use. We've probably been using components of this for decades with creative teachers. The key in understanding universal design is the idea that sometimes we have to provide kids information in ways that isn't typical. So just having a lecture for a bunch of children may not be the most effective way to teach them a topic. So utilizing video, utilizing audio, utilizing um, other active and project-based activities can be so crucial for young people to get access to their instruction. Similarly, giving them the opportunity to be evaluated in alternative ways. Sitting there with a paper and pencil, having to scratch out some sort of response might be extraordinarily hard for some of our kids. Why can't we have them talk through the answer or draw a cartoon, draw us a picture? I have students that I've worked with for years who've done projects showing me how something is done or have written songs or written poetry. So there's a wide variety of trying to get at how we teach and how we get information back from our students. And most importantly, finding interesting topics and content that will drive their motivation. So one of the great things when I think about Bookshare is that access to a huge library of high interest and age appropriate books that will give them more desire to work with the technology and have books be part of their lives. So I'm supposed, I'll, I'll take a break here for a sec and take a, a breath. If there are any really specific questions about any of these slides, if people wanna pop something in the Q and A, let me know. Um, and otherwise I'll move to the next slide. You guys can run the slide for me if you like. Okay, so okay, we'll thanks. save questions. Yes, yep. I'm sorry. No, no, you're fine, you're fine. I was just okay. Thinking, but yeah, we'll go to the next slide and we'll see if anybody has any specific yeah. questions, thanks. Sounds good. All right, so when we talk about changing the experience of, of reading for young people and for students with, with learning and thinking differences, one of the great things about using technology today is that we can add privacy to the portability and comfort of using technology that young people are already very comfortable with. When you're sitting in a classroom and you're turning pages at a different rate than your peers or you're watching your peers, it can be very sensitizing for young people. So being able to sit somewhere comfortable, have a screen where they can move as quickly or as slowly as they like can be really, really helpful to them. 
when we think about customizing the learning experience, you know, listen to the way that Kaylee and, and Ella had really customized what they did, learning about different fonts and colors and backgrounds using very specific voices. Um, what this does when you customize a learning experience is it creates something that we call agency. And agency is extremely important in education. Agency is that feeling of control and involvement in your own learning process. When we create agency in our students, what we create is motivation, the willingness to work harder, to work longer, to reach outside their comfort zone. And when we use technology effectively, this is something that can be really helpful to our young people with learning and thinking differences. One of the other very important aspects of using these kind of interventions is using multiple senses, multi-sensory learning approaches. Um, when we talk about how multi-sensory learning works, um, if you guys can think about what are we doing with text-to-speech, okay? We're using different parts of the brain. Text-to-speech technology um, uses the auditory as well as the visual. One of the really cool things is that when you look at the intervention services we're providing, the Orton-Gillingham method, Wilson, the Barton programs, they all use multi-sensory approaches. So while Ella wasn't necessarily doing direct instruction on reading, she was really just using her strategies. We saw on the other side of this that Kaylee was getting some direct instruction and they had some fairly similar overlaps. Okay, next slide, please. One of the coolest things about Bookshare is the integration of multi-sensory approaches. Text-to-speech technology provides a verbal model. That model is really important because one of the key deficits we often see with dyslexia is the inability to decode the word from the page, to be able to see that word and put the sounds together so you can make sense of it. When you have an audio model that can take away some of that challenge and provides lots of opportunities for repetition, so that is a really important part of that learning process. In addition, the pairing of that karaoke style highlighting allows students to follow along as they listen, not necessarily having to use their fingers, but having a bright and obvious form of cue that can help them move through the material. Next slide, please. The young ladies really brought up this issue and I think we talked about this in terms of using assistive technologies. The idea is that is, is using text-to-speech technology something that's cheating? Um, is this something that's not a legitimate experience? And I've worked with people over the years in schools, and there are some hardcore teachers who think if you're not physically engaged with the paper of the book, that somehow you're missing out on something. Um, and I think there's, you know, again, with, when we think about flexibility and inflexibility, in this situation, we have actual data through neurological studies, through magnetic resonance imaging during a functional activity that shows when people listen to text-to-speech or audio recordings of books, the same neurological firing is going on in the brain as when they read it with their eyes. So if you were to show the scans of somebody reading, and I didn't tell you if they were listening to the book versus reading it with their eyes, you would not be able to tell the difference based on the functional scans. That's the best answer to the question I can give you. If the brain can't tell the difference, then I would tell my teacher, let's be flexible with this youngster. They're getting the information. They're getting that informational fuel. Students who are you know, able to read along with these books and are gaining independence, this is an, a great opportunity because it gives them more choices to be independent. You bring that book home and there's no parent around or you're sitting separate from your teacher who's busy. This access to independent reading is a huge opportunity for them. And it's something that really can be life-changing. Next slide, please. When we think about the reading process, the two key factors I always think about is your comfort reading and the pace that you read. One of the things that was really hard for individuals with dyslexia is often that they feel like they read slower. The beauty of Bookshare is that it provides students access to their ability to pace their own reading by having very familiar controls to be able to pace, rewind, repeat, and go through information in a way that suits their comfort levels. And the controls are very intuitive, very easy for them to understand how to move through the technology. The nice thing again about having Bookshare and putting on some headphones is that it gives them the privacy of not being overheard and they can repeat information as much as they want, which is great at home. You know, as being a younger student, um, I had an older sibling who was somewhat rough on me at times. If she saw me struggling, sometimes it would be teasing around the house. 
Sometimes, you know, some peers would look at you and they give you a hard time. So really important to have that privacy and kids no longer to feel, need to feel embarrassed or upset about that. Next slide, please. So thinking about the benefits of Bookshare as a technology is really wonderful. Giving kids the opportunity to bring home books of their choice, to listen to it without a parent with them, um, to have that opportunity to be independently engaged in multiple titles. There's been some really nice research that shows when parents and children read together with text-to-speech technology, that they may have enhanced um, in interactions and more deep conversations when given some focused questions about what they're reading. So parents may have a conversation with the teacher about, hey, here are some strategies we can use to ask questions after this chapter or that chapter can be super, super helpful in that regard. And the opportunity for a child to maybe share this book with a younger sibling. Um, what we're really looking for is to build motivation to read, greater comprehension and fluency. And the research does show that in some cases, text-to-speech technology can elevate and increase this for students who are using that as the, a reading technique. Next slide, please. So one of the great things about Bookshare is that it's an integrated technology. It's compatible with a variety of apps. You know, Kaylee was talking about the way she uses it and Ella, and, and really talking about how they access things like the Read Write app, um, using um, Text Grabber, or in the case of Voice Dream Reader, a program that actually is an overlay that allows you to use over 200 different voices and provides note-taking support. So having a voice that you enjoy having you know, read to you can be a really great add-on to being involved with the reading task in general. Really fabulous you know, variety of options and technological integration. Finally, last slide here. Bookshare provides access to over a million titles. This includes you know, standard books, textbooks, and a variety of other periodicals. The nice thing about having free access to this technology and you've seen in the earlier slides, we're talking about identified learning disabilities, visual, physical, or perceptual disabilities that would limit the person's ability to independently read on their own. And it's available across most major platforms. So if you've got a piece of technology that's a Mac or a PC or an iPhone or an Android phone, you should be able to make use of Bookshare. So really exciting you know, to be a part of this today. I, I love what I've learned from these young ladies and their families. And it's, it's really been a great opportunity to be a part of you know, such a wonderful technology to help our, our students you know, improve their reading and engage more independently. Wonderful. Thank you so, so much for all that information, Dr. Khan. We really appreciate it. Um, our time, of course, uh, you know, is, is coming to an end. We do want to talk about some next steps for families. Um, so first, we are looking for stories. If you have used Bookshare, a student that you know has used Bookshare, please consider sharing your story with us. You can email communications at bookshare.org, and someone from our team will reach out to you. If you have questions regarding membership, I did see a few come through the Q&A. Uh, Amanda, who's helping me in the background, has been typing out some answers. Please email membership at bookshare.org. And again, someone from our customer service team will get back to you. And if you're curious for more information, our general website is bookshare.org. And the general website for uh, Andy, uh, Dr. Andy Khan is understood.org for that organization Thank you again for being with us and have a good night.